All right, the official iPad clock says 11.55, so why don't we get started? Um, so my name is Dino Daisovi. This is my first time attending Kubernetes Con and also my first time speaking at it. Um, but I was our first Kubernetes admin, set it up, and then we hired Trevor, who I basically gave all that to. Um, so I've done a good amount of this stuff, but I wanted to talk about how to scalably defend against attacks as you grow your infrastructure and especially in Kubernetes environments. Because what we're seeing kind of a, in a lot of places in the industry is that we're not, no longer being held back by the amount of infrastructure time we have available. Um, and we're just able to scale the number of nodes basically with a click, click, click on the cloud and you're done. So let's talk about how we actually approach security um, in those environments. And my background is uh, I'm what I call a breaker turned builder. I spent a lot of time breaking security I uh, got started in red teaming, uh, did a lot of security consulting, penetration testing, breaking into websites, software applications, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, wrote some books on hacking iPhones and Macs. I won a contest called Pwned Own where I hacked a Mac in a night. Um, did a bunch of all that stuff in security world. Um, presented the black hat briefings about how to write hypervisors, how to exploit memory corruption, all this sort of stuff. Um, but over the last several years, I've kind of taken a shift in direction and focused instead on using my understanding of attacks to build security, and especially to build it at scale. So um, I was director of security at Two Sigma Investments, my kind of first exposure to services-oriented environments, some of the challenges there. Uh, spent the last several years at Square, and uh, just recently founded a company called Capsulate, where we're building the industry's only real-time attack disruption platform, purposely built for cloud-native environments. And let me tell you about sort of what I'm trying to solve here. Um, in the security industry, we're talking a lot about the cybersecurity skills shortage. And there's a bunch of statistics and a bunch of ridiculous statistics about just how many people we need in order to actually make computing safe and stop breaches as being kind of a regular part of daily life. And uh, the problem with this is, I think it's just you know, fundamentally trying to scale the wrong way. Um, and so saying, yeah, we need 10 gazillion people to manually look through alerts, to manually do all this stuff, to manually audit all, these, all this code, to manually find every vulnerability, to manually patch every vulnerability. It's, you know, if you've ever written software, which hopefully most of us have, you realize that maybe that's not the best way to go about it. Um, and security wasn't the only domain with this problem. Operations was as well. You had to rack and stack machines, and every machine had to be configured individually in a special snowflake. And I guess it goes without uh, much explanation that that is a pretty antiquated way of looking at things now. And sort of what illustrates this, I think, the most clearly are statistics of number of servers per employee at different types of firms. And so, you know, the average company, it's less than one to one. Um, but clearly, Facebook and Google were able to scale much more significantly through that. And how did they do that? Well, they did it by treating operations like a software problem. And this pattern is what, what we now call the cloud. So that's, that's how, I, how I view it. And it's basically just another instance of software eating the world. So first, software ate ops, and now it's eating security. Um, and it's actually gonna be really interesting because um, it's actually gonna really change a lot of how, how I typically did things and how a lot of people I know did things, but I think it's for the better. So what do I want people to take away from this talk? I want um, people to think about sort of how do we apply a lot of the things we've learned from the SRE and DevOps transformations to security. So kind of my thought exercise for a lot of this is taking, you know, I saw, I saw that, you know, ops was very similar to where security is kind of still today. Um, and what, what, what principles did they learn and which of those apply so we can actually start from something that works. So one of my favorite quotes uh, from, I'm going to brutalize his name, Werner Vogel's uh, CTO of Amazon was, if you, you build it, you run it. This is their philosophy of, um, very similar to SRE and DevOps, of basically kind of putting the responsibility on the people that are closest to able to fix the code. And that's how you can scale that. Like, it doesn't mean you're responsible for everything. You can still have uh, infrastructure teams building infrastructure. You still have, um, uh, you, but you don't, ha and you can still have like SRE teams helping you, but you don't have one team that's fully responsible for it. And we still typically have one team that is fully responsible for security, and that's why it doesn't scale. So 
I think the new, the new mantra should be, you build it, you help secure it. And security can only scale with shared responsibility. And the more we can push to self-service, um, to uh, application developers and infrastructure teams, the more this scales better. And it actually doesn't require a PhD in the Defense Against Dark Arts. It's all very simple stuff. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is how to build a continuous security pipeline in cloud native environments and understand which principles of SRE and DevOps apply to security. So starting with a little background, um, some of the models that I think are really good to look at, um, the one that I know the best is the mobile security pipeline at Square that my team and I built. Um, it's a server-driven detection framework um, operating on millions of devices running thousands of uh, firmware versions in order to identify tampering, jailbreaking, or rooting, even if it's previously unknown. So if you have a root that's just you only wrote, um, the system can detect it, and it's pretty cool. I also looked at how Google did uh, a lot of their security monitoring with data mining. Um, one of the, some of the takeaways that they learned that I think are really useful is that um, purely statistical, like machine learning approaches, had very poor results. Um, and one of the reasons why is because in machine learning, a 80% true positive rate is actually pretty good. Like that's, a, that's an academic result. Um, in security, 20%, that's equivalent to a 20% false positive rate. So in security, 20% false positives is really bad. And what that also means is if you, as you scale more, like the workload and the number of servers, that amount of false positives basically becomes a, just a data problem. Beyond the human attention, you have now just saturated your servers and you've saturated the entire pipeline. Um, so that's some of the experience that they had that I think is pretty useful to look to. Um, also, the most recently, Netflix had a presentation about how they approached security monitoring, and they are using eBPF, which if you haven't started looking at eBPF, it is really awesome, um, but it's also really complicated and requires a really new kernel. Uh, I'll talk a little more about that in a little bit, but I think some of their requirements were pretty uh, illustrative. One, they needed the system to be event-driven. You can't pull around the network and be like, hey, are you hacked now? No, cool, I'll come back in 10 minutes. How about now? You hacked now? How about now? And then, you know, attackers, it's pretty easy to come in, come out, and be done. Because, um, you know, in the desktop world, kind of a, this, like when you're thinking about security of especially advanced attacks, you might watch an attacker for 60 days before you begin to evict them. Um, how many of you want to let an attacker roam around your production environment for 60 days? I mean, you should probably start looking for a new job like after like day one. Um, I think 60 minutes is too long. I think 60 seconds is too long um, because it's very easy to get a lot of data out fast. So we have to really change the, um, the cadence here. Uh, and so that's why it must be event driven. Uh, also, the system must be lightweight. Um, when you have a lot of nodes, you know, the amount of um, performance overhead scales really really quickly and gets really expensive very fast. And they also wanted to have kernel level inspection because uh, with how many uh, attacks against the Linux kernel that are being released today, there's entire open source frameworks full of exploits. And if you think about how long it takes someone to exploit a vulnerability and publish the exploit versus how long it takes you to patch your kernel across your entire fleet, you, you kind of do the math and you're like, oh man, that's a really hard battle to win. Um, and so that's what they were looking for. And what they ended up settling for was EBF probes, which are programmable, lightweight, safe probes that you can run in the kernel on Linux trace events. And I'll talk a little more about that in a little bit. Um, but at the broadest scale, what we're looking at to do to secure our systems is apply uh, the five factors to secure systems that I'm ripping off from Magoo. Um, and uh, basically, you start with one response. Make sure that you'll be able to uh, know about a threat and respond to it effectively. Second, make sure there's enough evidence. Make sure you can actually re reconstruct what happened and learn because usually there'll be one thing that you see is off and you need to be able to backtrack and see all the things that happened that were significant. There's a good balance there between that and performance. Um, and also focus on containment that you can limit the impact. So there's typically a spectrum between prevention and response. And like kind of the bottom three are the more, like the more prevention, the hardening. You set up your, your environment, you basically make sure you've configured it correctly, and then you walk away, right? And you can't have just that. It's sort of like, okay, we built a good bank vault, we put it in the middle of Central Park, and we've done our job, it should be fine, and we'll just not look at it. Um, a whole security program requires monitoring your response because we know there are known unknowns. Like we know there are new vulnerabilities, we know there are new attacks, and so we need to actually be on the lookout 
for, um, for when those happen so that we can actually respond effectively. And the cool thing about um, online services environments is that the attacker is on your turf. So, you know, we think about kind of a game of attack versus defense. The attacker gets to choose the timing and the method, um, whereas the defender gets to prepare the battlefield. So you can carve a nice little valley that looks really tempting, and you can wait for them to walk down it and just watch them. That's your, that's your prerogative as the defender. And so what I like doing is, you know, I like playing chess. I like thinking about strategy. Well, that's how I do, that's how I do defense, too. I basically set traps. I basically look, make really easy avenues that I can watch really effectively and respond really quickly to um, because the attacker has no way of knowing that. And that's where I can turn a information asymmetry to my advantage. Um, so that's, that's why, I think, why I think kind of a response game is a lot more fun and I'll hopefully it'll kind of get you all interested in it as well. Um, but then we look at um, prevention, make sure you're patching and all this other stuff because don't rely on a safety net if you don't have to and elimination, like can you innovate your way out of an entire class of vulnerability? And I think this is a really good way of breaking down kind of this process, um, sort of like the 12 factors are for stateless apps. So what should we call this thing? Like, this is like actually a common joke, I heard, heard it in the last talk as well. Uh, do we call this SecDevOps? Do we call it DevSecOps? How about DevOpsSec? It's like, hey, I can permute. We've all been in programming interviews. Um, or maybe we call it SecOps. Um, what I think of this as is continuous security because the real technology that people are getting out of the cloud is continuous delivery. And when you, when you start thinking about everything in this continuous cycle, you start thinking about big data differently. You think about fast data, not big data. You start thinking about how you architect your systems differently. And you start thinking about security differently as well. And so that's why I like emphasizing continuous security. And so what, is that, what does that mean to me? Uh, it's a software-driven pipeline to securing systems. So we act like we're benchmarking a piece of infrastructure or software. Do macro benchmarks and then optimize and optimize and optimize so that you know you're applying your defenses in the right, or your effort in the right place. And uh, it doesn't require having a dedicated security team. So I'm going to show you a really, really simple architecture that is basically a blog post and should look a lot like the... Um, sort of case studies that you'll see from like a cloud provider on how to build a streaming IoT analysis pipeline. It's pretty much the same thing. So, but in order to kind of guide how we're uh, gonna think about this, let's work backwards. Again, ripping off Werner Vogels. Um, so let's talk, start, start talking about server breaches. So how many of you have actually breached a server, gotten remote access? All right, wow, that's, I lost that bet. That's great. Um, and so for those of you that haven't, um, and haven't done penetration testing and things like that, I think it's really illustrative to see what it's like so you can know what you're defending against because they pretty quickly fall into a lot of common patterns. But uh, I'm going to talk only about Kubernetes environments. There's a lot of ways to do stuff, but Kubernetes is the new shiny, so let's talk about that. And what do we care about the most? We care about um, remote command uh, execution vulnerabilities that give people actually breach the server. And these are vulnerabilities that were, you know, some high profile ones over the last few years included shell shock, image tragic, um, a huge number of ones in, in Apache, but notably a vulnerability in struts that affected Equifax and the entire class of Java deserialization vulnerabilities uh, that some people called mad gadget. But the common theme with all of these is they're executing a shell. And then you're like, wait a minute, that's, I don't really run shells in my containers that often. Um, now you have a signal that you can, you know, hone in on. Um, there's other things you want to, might want to look at, um, like people SSHing into a shell or doing some other thing, or SSHing into a container for you know, to fix something in production. Um, not this isn't always malicious, but it's probably something you at least want to keep your eye on. Um, and if people are doing this, it's probably a signal that you they need an easier way to do their job. So how I like doing this is I like building monitoring, and then you'll see insecure practices, and you say, hey, all right, now I know the use case. Let's figure out something that meets that use case and is safe and have people do that. And it's sort of like the wisdom of the iPod. You know, people were downloading IP MP3s and people were, you know, they, people clearly wanted a digital music experience. They wanted instant gratification of grabbing a song and listening to it on the go. Um, and you could either fight it and call it piracy or you could build the largest music store in the world. I think we know which one actually was more effective. Um, so, the, let's, let's kind of go over like a generic data breach scenario. So first, what an attacker is going to do is they're either going to scan your infrastructure in particular 
or they're going to scan the entire internet. It's really cheap to scan the entire internet, so um, even though we all think we're special snowflakes, like don't always think every attack is actually about you. It might just be opportunistic, and then they might come back and see you know, which, one, which hosts are actually interesting. Um, but it's pretty inexpensive to um, just scan the internet for types of, these types of vulnerabilities. And actually, when I set up uh, our cluster and I add, you know, set up ingress on AWS the first time, I was amazed at how much just attack traffic was just going continuously. So you just set up anything on AWS, boom, within minutes you're getting, you're getting probed for a bunch of things. So let's try to make their, their job a little harder. But let's say what happens, they find all these vulnerabilities, they're able to get a shell in a container. And what I find interesting is that a lot of attention is paid on securing the container, or securing the host, like the kernel and that environment from the container, but not as much about the entire cluster. And when you think about the cluster, like that's what matters. An individual node, you'll burn it down. Burn it, like we burned ours down within 24 hours. It's just gone, next. Um, so compromising a node is not all that interesting. But compromising the entire cluster and persisting that way is way more interesting um, when you think about what an attacker actually is trying to do. So we're talking about a couple ways that are trivial uh, to compromise Kubernetes clusters. And so I don't feel bad talking about them because they're not vulnerabilities. It's just there's no security there. They're just like, they didn't try, it's just not there. So I consider it a, a um, obligation to make sure people know the limitations and make their own risk trade-off. Um, but uh, yeah, and then they establish persistence and move laterally within that cluster is basically how it's going to work. So let's start with talking about Shellshock. Shellshock's one of my favorite vulnerabilities because, and you'll see why, um, you can show people how to, even if people have never exploited vulnerability, if they've used a Linux shell um, a little bit and they've used curl, which many people have, you can show people how to exploit it in two minutes. And they can start like playing around with it and seeing it like, whoa, wait, I can run commands. Wait, is this how easy it is? You're like, yeah, that's pretty much how easy it is. Um, so this was a vulnerability that uh, abused some functionality in Bash, where Bash would pass exported function definitions and environment variables. And in that syntax, you could ac add extra commands so that when ba the next the, the Bash subshell was parsing and adding that function definition to the environment, it would also execute that command. So that's, that's the, the base of Shellshock, which is generally fine on the same system, but sometimes you can pass environment variables across a security boundary. So for instance, like, a lot of HTTP headers get turned into environment variables. And this happens in like, you know, CGI, but it also happens in PHP and a lot of other uh, application environments where you may not expect it. Um, you can also, people were also able to pop uh, DHCP servers with this, or DHCP clients with this. Um, a lot of fun stuff. So let's, let's engage in a little YOLO and see if my Eskinema link actually works. Nope. Open link, there we go. Oh wait, that's not the right one. Go back. Sorry, this is my first time using Google Slides for, for a presentation. And no, that one, that one, cool, all right. Okay, so this is how easy it is to exploit Shellshock. We're going to connect to a port forward to a vulnerable Shellshock container running in our Kubernetes cluster. It's just a standard Apache server, but kind of old. These came with a, um, a test CGI that was just a shell script, and this is kind of, you know, historic. Like this is this was true when I was a teenager, which means basically it's been true forever. Um, <laughs> so you don't find this as much these days, but it's still the default. But that's one of those instances where you can pass environment variables. Like you can see that those variables are HTTP headers. So let's let's play some shell shock. Um, so what we're going to do instead is we're now going to pass some environment, a specially formatted uh, value through the content type header because we can see that content type is one of those variables that it gets. And we're going to do kind of magic incantation and try and run a command. So let's just try and run id and we get a 500 error. Doesn't really tell us very much. So I don't know if it worked, I don't know if it didn't. So now let's try something that will tell us whether it worked, like a sleep. One, two, three, four, five. I have a pretty good idea that that worked, but let's be sure. Let's try with two. I can pretend I'm typing to make it more interesting. One, 1,000, two, 1,000, boom. So now we, now we have this deterministic feedback loop, which, um, 
really tells us as an attacker that you have some element of control. And the process of attacking systems is finding some element of control, leveraging it for more, leveraging it for more, and kind of building your way up, just like writing software. Like, I think the best metaphor that I've heard people describe hacking with is it's just you're building software out of someone else's software, like out of an existing ecosystem, and you have to kind of invent every single step of the way. So I find that people who have done a lot of programming tend to like it. Um, but, you know, just making a remote process sleep is not that interesting. What is a little more interesting is getting a remote shell. So we can use the bash command line that I pasted in there um, to actually use functionality built into bash to redirect from a socket and back to a socket and connect out. So now we're, you know, now we're actually hacking. So let's all right, go to the next one. Yes. So as so, what the attacker also does is they're going to set up a listening, like just like a netcat or something like that. Um, so I'm going to bounce to my AWS jump box. Now I have to change that IP address because I just gave it away to all of you. This, this stuff. All right. Um, and so you can just listen. You know, I mean, this is what you were doing in a, a different window when that's also happening. And um, so we're just going to run that command, and we're going to wait for a connection. Boom, we got a shell. And it tells us there's no job control in the shell because Bash is not really running with all the normal system bits that it expects. But we can see the runner directory. We can list the files. And as an attacker, what you're going to do is you're going to like look around. You're like, well, where am I? What's going on here? And you can see the host name that we're in a Kubernetes pod. Um, so oh yeah, we're on Linux, relatively recent, CentOS 7. Um, and that's basically where the, you know, where the game starts. Um, now, where it gets really interesting is privilege escalation from here. Uh, okay, so these work. We don't need to talk about those. Good, good, good. Um, yeah, so actually, uh, before we move on to privilege escalation, if you want to play along at home, uh, we published this container. So it's really easy to launch a shell shock and then actually see what an attacker can do in your cluster, which I really recommend. But Pay attention to the red warning at the bottom. Uh, don't expose the port. <laughs> Only do the kubectl port forward because this is a remote vulnerability. But uh, it's like you know not the only one in your cluster, I'm sure. So it's <laughs> it's probably fine. Um, <laughs> I'm not your normal security guy. I used to jump out of planes. No, mo most security people don't do that because um, it's not safe. Why would you do that? Um, but so this lets you see what an attacker sees if they would land a shell. So you can basically do that and kind of play around with hardening. Um, but now you're just an unprivileged user. And as you can see, I followed all of the uh, best you know, recommendations because I was running the web server as an unprivileged user. But that doesn't matter because what, what does root in a container really mean? Um, and now the problem is a lot of Kubernetes configurations um, are incredibly weak. They don't have RBAC turned on by default. Um, and even some tools like, uh, like so that cluster um, is a, was installed with COPS, and it does, doesn't enable RBAC. So basically, every container is full cluster root all the time. So from that shell, you can download kubectl and just start executing stuff and deploy a new pod, deploy a privileged pod, whatever. It's great. Um, and if that's fixed, if you install, if you're, if you're using Helm in your cluster, Helm also doesn't require any authentication. So you can just talk to the tiller service and be like, hey, install this chart, and you have full cluster root again. Um, so for a, kind of a live demo, this is kind of going a little bit on a tangent, but if you want to see more about that, I did a turbo talk at Kubernetes NYC on this YouTube link, um, and I just kind of went through it in 10 minutes, and it was pretty fun. Um, but we're playing defenders today. I'm not going to teach you all how to cause mischief. Um, so we want to work backwards from the breach. So according to this template, how do we um, build a system to monitor and detect this? So we need, one, we know that we need to monitor process execution within containers, right? We need, and we need it to be fine-grained. Um, we also need to monitor network connections because we want to know, for instance, like how many pods do you have that actually have a legitimate need to talk to the Kubernetes API to do stuff? Usually it's the kubelet. It's not necessarily your pod. So um, that might be a good thing to watch for. And then you can figure out when, when a pod that never does that even attempted it. Also, which pods should be connecting to your tiller service? Almost nothing, right? And so that's another thing that you can like kind of set a, uh, a guardrail, not a guardrail, I think of like more of an electric fence on. 
Um, and what you also want to make sure that your system that you set up does is it not, it also logs every attempt because even unsuccessful connections are a good signal. So if you have strict egress filtering so that no one can get out of your cluster, anything trying to get out is a pretty good signal you want to watch out for. And will tell you when something goes wrong. So it's either software that needs to be fixed or, you know, some situation that needs to be responded to. So let's talk about how we'd actually build a continuous security pipeline to get this. So our strategy is first, we want to gain visibility into the activity on our infrastructure. We want to make sure to enable investigation into past activity because whenever we see something, that's the tip of the iceberg. Something acts out of place, we're going to want to drill down deeper and see what's really happening um, and actually what led up to that point. And in order to scale, we need to, you know, we don't want to look over the logs. We want to start writing hard-coded logic to generate uh, alerts for this activity. And this is actually the part that I find kind of, I think, find people have the most fun with because this is sort of that where, like, you take some of the principles of SRE where you bound your toil. So you don't spend all of your time responding manually. You start automating responses. So if something does something weird, just shut it down. And even if you're not a security expert, like, just shut it down. Like basically, if something is acting anomalously, you can just, you know, kill it and move forward. And then um, if you have enough of a forensic trail, you can give that to a security expert, hire a security company and be like, hey, what went on here? Because I don't know. But at least you're defending yourself. And also build the automated responses to alerts. And do this iteratively. I like the, you know, I really like the principle of starting small and iterating because, um, you know, what I'm going to show you today is just really simple, but it gives you something that you can set up in a few hours and start having some capabilities to do this and to dive deeper as you find that you need to. Because if your visibility shows you that you don't really have any security problems, that you've already hardened everything perfectly, you can just stop there. But you have the safety net and you can like com come back to it every quarter and see if stuff's happening. It's better than blithely just not knowing. So how are we going to build the pipeline? First, we're going to have an event sourcing architecture that's gathered from various sources. Um, Existing data sources are good, like logs are great, but it usually doesn't give you the most, as much information as you'd want. So um, I recommend implementing sensors at various components uh, in various stages of your environment. So monitoring build pipelines, monitoring production as they, you know, behavior as they run, and kind of so that you can get that get more data to feed into this continuous security pipeline. These events we analyze, generate alerts. All the alerts you should. Always prefer automatic response where possible. And given that we're in a cycle, we can change the way that our hosts are deployed to make automatic responses more effective and more, and more possible. We can change the software and you work with the, the teams to make this capability as effective as possible. Just like you would if you're maintaining performance of production infrastructure. So what you do is you reserve your human time to monitor the alerts, do a manual investigation, tune the sensors to get more or less data depending on what you need and automate the responses. So the way that we set this up for our, our test bed is we have a Kubernetes cluster. It's got an auto-scaling set of nodes. And um, we have a, a sensor running on every node and then a log feeder that basically f sends everything to uh, AWS Kinesis. So we use Kinesis because um, I don't really want to manage a bunch of this stuff. Like, and so Kinesis is like, simple, done. Like, you do it. And uh, same thing with Lambda. It's like, cool, you scale that, done. Because that's not really what I'm good at, so I'll just let you do it. Um, and I'll focus on writing the logic instead. And, and then uh, one of the outputs you can configure with uh, Fireho Kinesis Firehose is Elasticsearch. And so this gives us uh, a, a Kibana instance so we can use the web to browse and go through this data. So this is actually like pretty simple. It's kind of a, uh, you know, it was like a couple days of work to actually make it. So it's not really that much. Um, and so here's a little deeper dive on how the Firehose connects to Lambda. So uh, uh, Kinesis Firehose lets you uh, use Lambda for transformation functions. So for us, we're just going to use the, um, the, the identity function, basically, as a transformation. Just return the same event. And on the side, if something is interesting, we're going to publish an alert to an SQS queue. And then we can monitor that SQS queue for those alerts and actually automatically respond. So it's actually sort of super easy here and we can write detection logic in, um, in JavaScript or in Python. And the nice thing about that is it scales pretty well with the complexity of the logic. So it's pretty tempting to like, you know, make a DSL, but you, this is not that complicated. These are JSON records and you're writing code to look for a string match, verify some conditions. Why do you need a DSL for that? 
but when you have a full programming environment, you can scale to more complexity as you need it and not get bounded and stuck by the, uh, the <coughs> stuck by the DSL. So the event sources that are interesting, you should look at your environment. Um, I'm talking AWS just because that's the one that I speak natively. So, um, you know, translate at where appropriate to Azure or GCP or internal infrastructure. Um, CloudTrail is good. Get all the API activity, see when the stuff is being used. Um, you want network monitoring, um, so you can see all your VPC flow logs for all your network activity. Um, but there's some limitations here. You don't see things within your Kubernetes cluster as well. Also, you definitely don't see them within a pod. Um, and then system monitoring. Um, so in order to get like system level behavior, you want a system monitoring agent. Um, I look, you know, there's five that I talked about here. Um, I'm talking about uh, Capsulate, the open source sensor that we're releasing right about now. I said right about now because I tried to do it today. It'll probably happen tomorrow. Um, Go Audit is a pure Go implementation of Audit um, using the kernel audit subsystem. Um, Go BPF is part of the IOVisor project. Um, so all these are GitHub URLs. You can just go there. Um, and it lets you actually write BPF rules that, that run. I thought I had an hour. Cool. Um, and oh, there's OS Query. It's also a really popular, really cool. Um, and Sysdig. So all of these are good. Um, and what you want to do is dive in deeper. So I've got five minutes, so I'm going to kind of go through a little faster here. Um, dive in deeper and see what actually happened. There's a couple trade-offs for each of these. Um, what Going by kind of the Netflix criteria, must be event-driven, uh, must be lightweight, and give kernel-level inspection, and be kernel version independent. Uh, naturally, the one that we wrote from the ground up, we basically checks all those boxes because um, that's why we did that. Um, and the other thing is audit has terrible performance. Uh, the, kernel the kernel subsystem is synchronous, so when it starts filling the backlog queue, it halts the activity. And so if you're monitoring something like system calls, uh, you will hit that backlog limit even if you just ratchet it up and the system will halt and you will get parabolic performance penalty. So that kind of is not an option um, in a lot of environments. So anything using Linux tracing performs much better. So um, Capsulate, Sysdig, Go Audit, or, uh, or sorry, Capsulate, Sysdig, and Go BPF all use Linux tracing under the hood, so they perform a lot better. Um, and shameless plug for the sensor, it's a single static Go binary. We don't use CGO, we just run it, it's fine. It uses all user land APIs, so it doesn't actually violate uh, a uh, signed kernel image, and it works everywhere from two, kernel 2.6 and up. Um, and it's very much in development because um, we're, we're still building it, but it's alpha, you've been warned, but it's Apache 2.0 licensed so you can, you can play. But this was a piece of our infrastructure that sent all its logs to Kibana for manual search, and you can now do things like say, hey, if someone launched a BusyBox container in my infrastructure, show me where that happened. And then you can now search for that unique container ID, say, hey, show me everything that happened and give me all process execution events and, and see everything there. Um, and yeah, I talked a little bit about Lambda. Um, it's easy because it scales up and the language scales up with you, whether you're familiar with JavaScript, Python, or, or Java. And when you're automating responses, you can take events off that SQS queue and don't overcomplicate it. You can just write a simple shell script that does you know, AWS SQS command line, pipe it to JQ, and then pipe that to kubectl delete. And boom, you have an automatic thing that kicks any offending pod, and you can do this at each tier of your infrastructure. As you develop this, the thing that you want to do is always escalate the attacks you can simulate and your responses, and you can keep training yourself. So play with some open source security tools, but I recommend doing things like if you have an open source, if you have a bounty program, try and find the researchers before they report the vulnerability. Um, hire a penetration testing team, try and detect them before they, are, before they report. And when you get really advanced, hire a red team that tries not to get caught and try and catch them and try and make their life hell. Um, and that's basically, once, you, once you're at that level, pretty much most attackers are gonna have a really hard time attacking, your, attacking you and you'll do it across your entire environment, yay. Um, thank you for your time. I think I'm out of time now, so if there's any questions, please come up. Yes? Yes. Yeah, uh, they're, they're hot off the presses. Yeah, so, uh, 
Okay, so they, they give me the five minute sign, so I will just do Q&A until they kick me off the stage. So, all right, next. Yeah, that's another thing that we made sure to design around because uh, when you are having like local service proxies and all these other things, what you want to monitor is who the container thinks it's talking to because the service mesh and all this other stuff is going to change how it gets there, but which service it discovers and which it's reaching out to is really important. And so when you're using um, Linux tracing-based um, uh, tracing based infrastructure in containers, you're monitoring the system calls. And so you're seeing the, the address that the application is passing to the kernel. And that's how you can identify where that goes. And there is definitely some work that you need to do on the back end to um, kind of enrich the events with where that service was at that time. But you know, what, like, this application is trying to talk to Tiller, not is at talking to this IP address and then three days later trying to figure out what, I, what was running on that IP address. Because the, the kind of the anti-pattern of security monitoring in the modern world is looking at an IP address and then be like, okay, cool, I had 100 containers running on that IP address at, you know, f five days ago or 30 days ago, what do I do now? It's just no longer a meaningful identifier. Um, and also with things like domain fronting and like, which are, works really well in the cloud, domain fronting is a technique where you, um, to connect to a website or web service under one name, so your DNS lookup is for one name, and your HTTP host header is another name. So, like Google and a lot of other services do this, where you can reach any service from any any entry point. And you think about how ingress works, you kind of figure out how that stuff works too. So it's really easy for an attacker to evade these IP address based things. Yes. Um, I haven't, a little bit. So one of our, one of our engineers installed uh, Container Linux or Clear Linux and went, went to town on it. Um, and then everything broke and found out it was a little more work for his desktop than he wanted. Um, but what I discovered kind of being on both sides is being a security person saying, hey, we need to reduce attack surface. And so initially we started with for our own development um, using uh, from scratch Docker containers. And then debugging those in production was impossible. And debugging, like, how, for, for instance, hey, why is this container not able to resolve this service? Everyone else can, but that one can't. I don't know. What does it think it's connecting to? You can't, you can't get a shell in there, and there's, there's people have workarounds for that. So I kind of, how I resolve this myself is the extra two megs for a busy, you know, doing from BusyBox or from Alpine are well worth it for that debugability. Um, and what you really care about is the security boundary outside the container. So have a shell in there, it's no big deal, but focus on the, the container security boundary and the um, kind of the cluster security boundary. And one of the limitations of a lot of the hypervisor-based container runtimes is they don't really do much for the, um, for the interface to the Kubernetes API. So you still have cluster root, you just can't do anything to the node. So I'm like, all right, well, that's a lot of good that does. Behind you. Yep. Yep. No, we, we just realized that um, the, the magic of BPF is really Linux tracing. So you can get all of that through perf. And so that's, you basically get all the K probes, trace points, U probes um, through perf. And that goes back to uh, 2639. Um, and is, you know, what BPF gives you is the ability to do advanced filtering. But with, with just existing trace events, you have a rudimentary AST-based filter built into the kernel. So you can do logical expressions and other things so that you're not throwing every event to user land. Um, and when you are throwing events to user land, it's over a high-speed um, ring buffer. So it's actually not that bad. Um, yeah, so it's basically, it's fun. It's like, if you looked into the architecture of Sysdig, like they have a kernel module to do stuff that the kernel already does. So you already have the ring buffers for perf, you already have the, the trace events accessible through perf. Um, and I didn't, you know, I'd like to uh, indirectly thank Brendan Gregg for his blog posts for, that's how I figured this stuff out. I was like, oh, that's cool. Uh, any other questions?
Yes, sir. Similar to uh, like the clear containers project, I, I see a lot of this hardening is necessary but not sufficient. Like I don't want to denigrate this work. It's all it's all really cool and like I wrote a hypervisor in a past life and I think that stuff is really cool. Um, but uh, you still and so that's a really good way to have that iso that host isolation. But there's performance downsides. You're basically committing a bunch of RAM, um, and the kernel interface is generally pretty good anyway. Um, but they don't do much for that like kind of the the orchestrator level security and. When I work backwards from a breach and like kind of think about as an attacker, how am I going to attack this? How am I going to get the objectives that I want? How am I going to achieve the objectives that I want? Um, I see once I see any security projects going in a certain direction, you're like, yeah, just don't even bother looking. Like uh, I can't remember who had the quote. So they said something about cryptography is great. It tells me where as an attacker not to look. <laughs> it's like don't even bother, you know. Like and and same thing with I, I see the same thing with. Um, memory protection systems like ASLR. You randomize at, you know, locations and stuff. And when you're an attacker, like if there's, it's easy to start thinking about the strength of ASLR and the number of bits of entropy, just doing a quantitative analysis. But whether it's really four bits or 256 bits, it doesn't really matter. Because once you have more than one bit of entropy, you're, as an attacker, you're gonna start working around it. So um, that's kind of how I see the, a lot of the hardening. It's when there's, it's, there's, a lot of effort there. You don't really know what's going to be there, but you know that Kubernetes doesn't really do a lot currently. Um, yes. When you when you were talking about uh, source sources, yeah. Uh, do you think the Kubernetes API server also has a block? Yes, it does. Yes, it's a good point. Yeah, uh, we don't yet, and so for our internal system that this is based on, um, uh, yeah, it's a big, it's a big blind spot. So until we fix that, no one go hack our build servers, please. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Can I repeat? Uh, yeah, he, he mentioned, pointed out that the Kubernetes API servers have an audit log, and that, that would be an excellent uh, event source for the system, so that you could see when a pod is abusing the API or abusing its privileges. Thank you. Any other? Uh, yes, yes, sir. That's another very good point. I should have made that. Uh, a signal stopping is a huge signal in, a, in and of itself. And um, one of when you're really getting serious about designing these systems, what you also want to make sure to do is tie in kind of a the monitoring with a transaction so that they can't turn it off and still be functional. So if you can, if you can implement a way where uh, if you don't see any events from a node in a certain period of time, turn off its port. You, there's no events, shouldn't be on the network. It's not doing anything. Um, and you can kind of experiment with this stuff um, so that turning off an attack, or sorry, turning off a monitoring agent is is the biggest red signal, you know, biggest red flag on the play, and possible. Uh, actually, let's 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 change from comments to pro tips. Anyone else have any any good pro tips on doing things like this? I might put another dude on the spot about how to do this at large scale. Yeah, I'm looking at you. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm looking, sorry, I'm looking, looking at Mike. It's Linux only. Yeah. Yeah, we're focused completely on production environments. Uh, is there in the back? Uh, you mentioned Helm a couple times. Uh, one of the common patterns I'm seeing is people wanting Helm not to be like the entry point to do anything your cluster is, run them in separate namespaces, and then set up our back so that even Helm can't do everything. So like your production cluster, you can only do a limited subset of things. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Uh, Definitely apply RBAC to Helm or to Tiller so that basically it is so it is isolated on what it can do, um, even given kind of a lack of authentication. And also, the thing I didn't mention is if you're using um, 
this is where I'm definitely on the border of my knowledge. It's uh, using things like Calico and like having that workload separation um, built into the network layer. It's going to be you know impossible for you to hit um, Tiller that's running in a different namespace. But without that, you can like it's a flat. It's, it's a, even though it's a, if it's in a separate Kubernetes namespace, um, you uh, can still reach it over the network and you can still resolve it through kubedns. So no matter what no matter what um, Kubernetes namespace you're in. There's actually a lot of great work being done with, so I'll repeat a question, uh, th there's work being done with Tiller to do delegated authentication and authorization um, using the user's credentials. Um, and uh, there's pretty exciting stuff happening with uh, Spiffy right now and building kind of identity aware, or, I, like workload identity aware authentication into the fabric of your cluster. And I don't, I haven't seen how far they've gotten with like delegation, but that's sort of the next step. Um, and so it's stuff that, you know, I think why Kubernetes 2.0, we're going to have a lot of this, and that's the secure version. Yes? Honestly, I don't really think a lot about that. So I, I don't want to give advice that I haven't thought through. Um, I know people have done cool stuff with Vault. Um, uh, I was at Square when we open sourced um, KeyWiz. Um, and actually, ironically, I was like, wait, we're open sourcing the thing where we put all our secrets? Am I the only one that thinks it's a bad idea? We're telling people where our secrets are and how it works? <laughs> but it turns out you actually do get a lot of benefit out of it and making the system stronger. But that took a perspective shift on my side. Um, with etcd, um, the thing that I've seen you know, with kind of my experimentation and different cluster setup tools is that you don't always have authentication on the etcd <coughs> masters. And so even if, even if it's authenticated, you can just access the keys directly. Um, and there's a lot of these areas where, oh, it'd be great to have, make sure that there's authentication on the kubelet, which it supports, but for some reason it's not configured by this tool. And my advice I usually give people is um, there's a lot of knobs that you'd be surprised aren't turned on by default in different tools. Um, so if you don't want to go through all this stuff, um, a cloud provider or a commercial distribution of Kubernetes tends to be your best, your best option. Um, Sure. So um, I don't actually believe, like my philosophy on these things is I don't like hard blocks because um, it has a high potential of breaking things. What I like is a low latency response. Um, because when you are out of line but have a low latency response, you can, um, uh, you just have a lot more options. And you don't want to do pure bulk data analysis because that increases the latency significantly. But if you look at how um, a lot of People do things like automated trading is one example. You'll do a lot of data analysis to build the models to run in real time. And I think that is a good model for defending your infrastructure because you um, are penalized similarly. If you make the wrong decision fast, that's bad. If you make the right, you know, if you miss something fast, that's also bad. But you need data analysis in order to inform what actions you're going to take in real time. And so what I focus on and, you know, we focus on at Capsule 8 is a... Uh, low latency response, low latency automated response to security incidents and kind of that architecture. But I don't want to go too much into the product plug, so I'm just going to talk about the open source, the open source component, and that doesn't do any of that today. Uh, like a read-only event, yeah, read event stream. It's a uses probes, so basically it is a you know it's um, uh, you know you can call it like the, the analog of eventually consistent. You know it's um, because blocking 
can, tends to be really disastrous in production environments. So, but you have to go through a pretty significant system load to start dropping events with with perf and the ring buffers. In a Kubernetes environment, yeah, I recommend a daemon set. It's one, it's one, it's one command to do it. Yeah, I mean, I think the if you for like the the capsulate sensor is a single binary, so we provide a Docker file for it, and it's pretty easy to throw that in a daemon set, and and you're good. And then um, there's a gRPC API to communicate with it to gather all the telemetry that you're interested in, and provide filtering options that are all evaluated in the kernel. So you can say, and it's all dynamic subscriptions. So you can say, hey, this is what I want. So you can have one level agent that is, or one level subscription that is monitoring something across the board um, at one performance profile. And when something interesting happens, you can then, you know, increase the subscription. You can say, <coughs> oh wow, that container is interesting. I want to see everything that it does. I want, and I'll pay the performance penalty to log every system call for that container in particular, um, and so on. Yes, sir. Yeah, they're doing a lot of similar things, but one of the th things I noticed about OSEC is that um, I kind of like using cloud APIs um, because like, one of the things that I like about this architecture uh, of putting detection logic in AWS Lambda is the attack surface is minimal, right? Because you don't have to worry about, because like, for instance, all right, let's, let's put our attacker hats on. Okay, so what is the, you know, wherever that detection logic is, I want to know what the detections are and I want to modify them, right? You know, and, um, and we're also where all the logs are, I want to know that and modify it. And so you, if you make that more difficult, um, you're, you're winning. So that's why I like Lambda, because I'm like, yeah, I'll just write my logic in there and let Amazon scale it. And, you know, I'm, I mean, if Amazon's infrastructure is compromised, I mean, I'm pretty much host anyway. Um, but it, that's one piece I'd have to worry less about. And I don't, like, it's not really that complicated. So I didn't see a benefit to adapting it. Well, because if you're using a cloud provider, you're already depending on the security of, of their environment, plus also your, your credentials and your IAM isolation model and other things. And this is an easy way where you can, if you also care about um, sort of separation of concerns among staff, you can even do things like say, all right, cool, well, for various reasons, um, we won't let one team look at the data, but we'll let them write the detections. And they can see the alerts, but they can't see raw data because there might be PII in there or something like that. Um, and you can implement a lot of that a lot easier um, with those those tools. Also, they're new and shiny. Yes? It's not a question, but an answer, actually. Like, someone asked about secrets, and I, I, I've done a bit of work on that. I'm great from Google. Um, hey. So uh, I think try and sum up what we're trying to do with secrets is essentially try and give people an opportunity to use external stores securely and to give them the, the way to uh, integrate uh, with those external stores, but those external stores like custom built programs like like keywords like all well, that, that are really good at like uh, holding secrets and auditing them. So I think as Kubernetes I see our job with secrets as making it so easy to integrate systems and use them. Cool. Does anyone want me to repeat that? Be able to hear him? Cool, thanks. Yeah, so right now, just looking at like things like health check, make sure that it's still running, and using kind of Kubernetes uh, health monitoring to identify when it has been shut down. But when you think about uh, tamper proofing or making tamper resistant software that runs in an environment that could be compromised, um, it's a bit challenging, but it's, um, I spent several years doing it, so I, can, I have my ways that I like doing it. Um, and what 
I find works well is that um, what an attacker can't do is they can't be everywhere at once, and they also can't go back in time. So if you, you figure out like that terrain, and you're like, okay, what is really hard for them? Like, if I'm going to modify the software, I'm going to need to reverse engineer it. I need to know how to do it. I'm going to need to do this stuff that will generate signal until it happens. And also, they'll have to um, kind of you know, have some preparation. And so you could, those are pressure points that you can you know, add difficulty. Um, on that side, Go binaries are incredibly easy to reverse engineer. Um, they love having symbols for everything. So um, I think modifying a Go binary to tell it not to do a thing is like probably about 20 minutes in ptrace. And if you use a little more advanced tools, it's like five. <laughs> so that's, we're not there yet. Um, I mean, I, as an industry also, like at that level. But um, I think one of the benefits of the cloud and like the kind of more nimble infrastructure is that you can, being able to just tear things down and restart and build sort of more um, kind of, uh, if some evasionness, some like um, deception into your infrastructure makes it really hard for the attacker in that infrastructure. Um, and so that they can't just download a piece of open source software and figure out how it works and where are the knobs to turn. Because um, when they, they say, oh, you're running you know, this piece of software, I, I know how to disable that. It's like, oh, okay, cool. Well, the binary image is totally different. So try and find that, try and find that piece in my environment. It's a little different. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, and once you have, like one of the things I realized with continuous uh, build pipelines is it lets you do a whole lot of cool stuff. And when you have a continuous delivery pipeline, a continuous security pipeline, you basically don't have to set it and forget it and get hacked. You can do a lot of cool, you know, a lot of fun stuff. So I don't want to give away all the, all of my ideas just yet, but stay tuned. Any, any more? Okay, cool. All right, I'm gonna let you all go. If, you got, if there's any questions, come up. Thank you for staying, thank you for coming.